Welcome to Creator Talk. Um, again, my name is Scarlett. Um, and at Creator Talk, we talk to le industry leading folks. And this one's right from here in Philly. So I'm really excited to kick it off. We're talking about artist friendly and creator first methods. Um, so, and this is actually another really unique conversation because it's manager to manager. And I can't wait to learn as well as just ask questions about your journey and what's next. Because I feel as managers, as people who are champions, for artists and their rights in the industry, we have to keep learning so we can keep teaching and keep protecting. So I'm really excited to get into that, but tell us about yourself and tell us what, what's important to you about yourself. Um, you know, one, th uh, thank you guys for having me. Um, it's, it's amazing to see because Will, I'm, I probably met Will maybe six years ago when he was in the old space. The warehouse, you already know. And, um, and he walked me through this place when it was under construction. And so like no walls up or anything. And like, you know, they, I think they were just We didn't have the walls cement. at the old space either. So, yeah. you know, it was kind of the same. <laughs> but like to see the vision come into fruition and actually see creatives in the space and kind of see the space activated and people in action creating is, is, is amazing. And, um, you know, I'm from Philly. I used to actually hang out here when this was the gallery back in the day. You got your airbrush teas <laughs> and your Chinese food downstairs. In C Cinnabon. The, that, the, the KFC in front of the FYE. You yeah, know the exa vibes. Exa Absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. But, um, yeah, but just happy to be here. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for being with us, Troy. So I loved how you really teed us up, right? You, you saw us at the warehouse, tarp as a ceiling, windows for walls, all the way to here and Sometimes, you know, a business and or someone's journey is, is a lot like that. So why don't we talk about your warehouse days? You know, what was I know y'all you went as Lil Troy. So who is Lil Troy and what what was Lil Troy all about that sparked that itch uh, to work with artists? Yeah, um, I think um, hip hop. I, I, my dream wasn't Period. to work with artists. Um, I just fell in love with music and the music industry. And like hip hop was just like sort of becoming this new medium, but you also had um, a culture forming around it. So it was um, break dancing, it was fashion, um, it was graffiti, it was DJing. And so it was this whole new culture that was hitting at the same exact time. And, um, and it was a movement around it. So, and so being young, and, um, and seeing, you know, you either had um, drug dealers in the neighborhood with, the, with great cars, or you had guys like Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince who had great cars. And, um, and I just got lucky enough to meet those guys, and they sort of set me on the path that I'm on today. Wow, I mean, two incredible names who are still creating legacy and huge things today. So. Um, I'd love to hear more about like the parallels between because when we think about, you know, DJ Cool Herc and the rec room and the birth of hip hop, we think about New York. How was Philly parallel to New York or adding something different to that beginning of hip hop with people like School E.D.? Yeah, what was, was interesting, um, it was these guys, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Goodman and his brother Dan, uh, Dana Goodman from West Philly, who started um, a record label called Pop Art Records. Um, what people didn't know is a lot of people from New York, were, they were coming down to Philly to get record deals. So um, Pop Art ended up signing like Salt and Pepper for their first record, Roxanne Shante, Biz Markey, so a lot of the old Rest school hip-hop guys. Yeah, and Biz was a great friend of mine. Um, but like, but for, for, so Philly was, a, was sort of the mini mecca. And it started creating its own culture. And it was a lot of really dope entrepreneurs who were building these small record labels. Um, Rough House Records that was out in Conchahawk and that signed the Fugees and um, a, a bunch of other acts. So it was Philly, Philly was, was pretty much a small little epicenter. How do you feel Philly today parallels the Philly back then? How are we creating or incubating culture the way that we did back then? Or are we not? Um, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the issues, you know, and I think this is, was, was good about what, um, what you guys are building here, um, Philly was always great at exporting talent. So, so you had, um, you didn't, but you didn't have the, the, the business infrastructure 
to support the talent long term. And so when, like, if you look at Atlanta today, you have um, QC, LVRN, um, uh, like a, probably six or seven really rock solid um, labels, production companies, managers. And they all, although they compete, they've built a culture that's, um, that support artists across the board. And they support each other too as well. And, um, and they didn't leave the city. They, they actually stayed within Atlanta. So that way Atlanta artists really don't have to leave. In Philly, you don't really have the infrastructure here. And so, um, so people are forced to go to LA, go to Atlanta, go you know, where, uh, New York, wherever else or whatever. Um, but, but it's, and that's why it's good to have places like that, like this, where it could sort of become an epicenter. Absolutely. Because at, at the soul of this place, you know, you saw it without walls, without anything up. Uh, it's the people that bring the soul, you know, into it. And, and I believe that history repeats itself. So if Philly was the start, it's, it's going to come right back to us. And I feel like, especially now with the internet and social media and the people that are coming out of here, like Tira Wack, the Japanese breakfast, the little Uzis. Um, that our eyes, the, the eyes are definitely going to come back to us because we used to be a great tour stop and press city. Now we're barely a press city and barely a tour stop on like these bigger acts coming through. Yeah, I think um, like cause the, 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 the music is always going to be here. Like just the level of talent here is, has always been super consistent. Um, Philadelphia needs the infrastructure for, um, for the entrepreneurs. So, so that, that's the missing piece of the puzzle. It's like, can the entrepreneurs um, have infrastructure where the city actually supports it and where the entrepreneurs can support each other? And, um, and the other thing that's important, too, um, that we that we seen work, um, whether it's in technology or, or whatever else, is when you have density. And so the next version of Rec Philly or, or production company or whatever else should be one block over. And then the next one, another block over. The You're next one, another block over. You're trying to make Market Street to look like Times Square, you know, with everything that, that's on Market Street now with all those TVs. Um, but I, de I definitely feel it getting there. And I definitely feel like we were, we were named, uh, I think, the number one city for music tourism, uh, which I think is really important because, you know, we had those three nights of Taylor Swift. And I don't care what you think about her. She ate. You know, like she was here in this city and she brought a ton of business here. Um, so I'm excited to see a lot more of that happen. And that happens when their soul and the culture stays here. Love it. So talk to me. You know, we're going backwards. We're talking about little Troy again. Uh, what was it like getting in with DJ, DJ Jazzy Jeff and Will Smith? Because I feel like we have similar stories of I'm going to show up and you can't get rid of me. And I'm going to say yes to everything. And I'm going to do it damn well and with a big smile. And you're going to want to keep me around. So tell me a little bit about that story. Yeah, I think with Will, um, Will, Will's business partner is a guy named um, JL, James Lasseter, who um, he grew up in West Philly as well. Actually, I was at dinner with him in L.A. last night. We're still close. And, um, but those guys, Will, Will was a master class and vision for me. And so, you know, when we were coming up, you know, we had this idea around um, thoughts become things. And when you can see that idea early on and you actually see it come into fruition, you actually, um, that's, that's the core, that becomes the core of your belief system. So being able to get lucky enough when we were younger to see, you know, guys that we were in talent shows become uh, boys to men and, you know, break Elvis Presley's record on the charts or seeing our friend who worked at City Blue um, and, and who was a fashion designer, you turn on TV and she's on TV singing with two other girls and she has a condom on her eye and his left eye. And, you know, and then Will goes become, you know, one of the biggest movie stars in the world. That programs you to understand um, possibilities. So from a young age, it was you know, come, nobody in my family was ever in the music industry or, um, you know, it, we, we come from a blue collar family. So these crazy visions that I had for myself 
there was no there there weren't people within my family that could actually support it from a standpoint of I see your vision. They thought I was fucking crazy. <laughs> I, I would have thought what I was crazy. What do you mean you're not going to be a doctor, astronaut, lawyer? No, no you mean UPS or, or FedEx. <laughs> Nobody in my family even went to college. Like my, my, my grandmother got her GED when she was in her 50s. My grandfather worked at Campbell Soup. My dad was in prison until I was 20. You know, so, so like and my mom worked at Children's Hospital. So like it was no, college wasn't even a conversation. You know, I dropped out in 11th grade. So like, but if dropping out in 11th grade and saying that this is the, you got this big vision for your life, a lot of people can't see it. But I got lucky enough to see other people's dreams come into fruition. And so I was maniacal about um, driving the Mack truck through the cul-de-sac to do whatever it took to be able to see it through. I love that. I mean, let's give it up. Like, that's really incredible because what, what I took from that was, was two big things, right? One, emotional intelligence. Um, I think to be that young, and I feel like that's when it really I started uh, practicing what it meant to be emotionally intelligent, what it means to manifest. And I think as artists, you know, or as artist managers, sometimes they're like, yo, the artist managers are just the people who wish they were the artists. <laughs> And they, they couldn't get in the booth, you know, but I think that how do you remove your ego and be a coachable team member to an artist like that, that has such a strict vision? How do you provide feedback um, and not be just a yes man and, and support an artist through that vision? You know, I, I think um, part, of, part, of, part of being a great manager is you got to really, really, really care. Like, you got to really care. It's the reason why I stopped doing management, by the way. It's the reason why I stopped. Um, and, and I say that to say, I, you know, when, when I managed, you know, Eve was my first client. And, um, and Eve was my first like we became really good friends. She's like my, my, my younger sister. And, um, and so the level of protection that I had was, it wasn't as, it wasn't transactional. It was, this is my sister. So the relationship. I, I, yeah, I owe it to her to figure out this problem or I owe it to her to get smarter and smarter so I can make, I can help make her better and better. So it is it's a lot a lot of it is being selfless and um and willing to sacrifice, you know, you cuz as a really 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 great managers you you you're putting your client before yourself a lot of times and your family and you know your your personal life and all of those things. So like that level of commitment will d help drive you to um to, to, to become more successful. Absolutely. And, 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 and the ego part is, is not, is not about, is a, is a mutual thing, by the way, is, and, and the best relationships um, between an artist and a manager is, is, is a real partnership. And so it's not about you or, or the artist. like, and the artist, the artist has to know it's not about them. Is about the mission. And, and, and when the artists with big egos um, are, they, they fail in so many areas. And, and, and it's almost impossible to keep um, a team together, keep your outside partnerships and all of those things, because you made it about yourself. Artists that, that are really smart and understand the mission, they're, 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 they're thinking about, okay, Nike's my partner on this. I got to make sure that, that I show up for Nike in a way that makes that person who put their job on the line look great. I'm going to show up on time. I'm going to over deliver. And so, and so th this is the sort of the psyche of, a really successful artist. And it's, 
I've only seen a small percentage of artists kind of fit in that category, but the ones who fit in that category are the ones that we that we all like we we see how their careers have gone years and years and years. Absolutely. And it's about again surrounding yourselves with the people that think the same way, you know. Uh I I think about, you know, my own love language is like, you know, acts of service. And some people do it by being a doctor, a nurse, a lawyer, and I get to do it through the arts, through management, through community building. Um, but what I feel is the most important is, at least to me right now, living in Philly, building this is culture fit. Um, so can you talk about culture fit? And, you know, if I'm a manager, but I want to work in country, but I'm from the city or I'm from the country and I want to work with a city artist, how important is culture fit? Does it have to be innate? And how can you be a good malleable manager to the culture yeah i think um i never wanted to be put in 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 any box and so like in my in my career i managed hip-hop r&b pop rock like uh electronic you know you sort of like across the board and um and part of it is no it was crazy one of my best friends called me up yesterday. He, he, he was pissed off. He said, you know, um, Billboard magazine, they're doing um, the, the, indie, the Indie 100 or whatever, where it's like the top independent people in independent music. And he was saying that um, his PR person said, hey, you didn't make the list. But the good news is you made the list for R&B and hip hop for Billboard. And we laugh because he doesn't do R and B and hip hop. He's just, he's Indy black. All of a sudden, is he's, DIY and cottage core, and you got to be right there and, with the ukulele. Yeah, yeah. And he broke one of the one of the biggest independent pop stars this year. But because he's a, a a black entrepreneur, they automatically assume that he'd be happy about being nominated for R and B and hip hop. And so for 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 me. I wanted to make sure that um, I was able to explore different genres. Um, a lot of it had to do with just me not wanting to hit a ceiling in my professional career. But also it's like, if you're a really great manager, you could manage any, you could manage any type of act because it's about people. It's about people. The business doesn't change. You know, the foundation of the business is still the same. You might have different relationship sets, but if you understand people, then it's like dealing with the country programmer is not going to be any different from dealing with the hip hop programmer because you're dealing with people. So um, I just would say like, you know, and I, I was I, I, I did an executive stint at Spotify for a few years. And one of the things I made sure with my team was that nobody got stuck in genres like you can you can start in this genre but I'm going to make you do this genre and this genre and this genre it's as the well. Jay-Z, no, no, no genres, just good music, yep. period. And then yep. Jay-Z went on to be some of the biggest uh, champions and broke a lot of what Fall Out Boy did yeah. back in like 2005, 2007. So we'll get into that. Um, I'll always bring it back to Fall Out Boy. Um, <laughs> let's bring this back. I know I'm interested in learning more about your relationship with Eve, right? It wasn't just like y'all appeared and now, you know, you're managing her and all this relationship. How did that get started? You know, I met Eve. The first time I met Eve was, I think she was probably 16 or 17. And we had a studio in Philly and her and her rap partner at that time came out to do an audition at the studio. And, um, and then fast forward a couple years later, um, I got a call from, um, from a friend of mine who said he had signed Eve to Dr. Dre's label and that um, he wanted me to, he brought me on board to sort of help him figure out the structure of the company and everything else. And so that kind of reintroduced Eve and I. I love that. And I feel like, again, that building of the relationship, what did you learn? Like if there was like one big thing that like, you learned and you still take with you from that specific time, what is it? That I didn't know anything. Hey, yo, <laughs> that part. I think, I think that the most powerful thing to say is I don't know. Like the older hard. I get, like I, I thought I, I used to be pissed off at myself when I was like, I'm, 
I don't know, but I'm not going to let them know I don't know. So yeah. I'm just going to like BS and, and throw something out. But I think that's really powerful to be like, you know, especially post pandemic or like pandemic that we're in now. But it's like uh, I, I turn to my mentors and they're turning to me. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you ask anybody what's going on in the industry. You're the industry. You are making it every TikTok you make, every piece of content you put out in real time. And I think that's empowering and super scary to a bunch of people. Um, so management, you start with one artist. Did you stay with one artist? How did that grow? Yeah. Um, in the beginning, it was primarily Eve for probably a couple of years. And, um, and I just went deep because I was on the road with her and everything. Like, it, it, like I was pretty much the day to day plus the road manager half the time, Oof, uh, which are all different roles. <laughs> yeah. And, but like I had to learn like the, the, these different areas. And so, um, yeah, so I primarily focused on her, and then um, we ended up doing like Beanie Siegel and Freeway and Oskino and Sparks, and um, then me and Jay Irvin we merged our companies and did Flower Tree together. Uh, uh, then we sold the company, brought uh, ended up doing Nelly, um, uh, Khalees, and a bunch of other acts, and then from there it sort of spun out and started Adam Factory and um and Lady Gaga was the first artist that we signed to Adam Factory. Oh my god, light flex drop. Pick <laughs> it up. Talk to me about Lady Gaga because that was also in such a specific time in the internet, right? Like I I think everybody like remembers where they were when they first heard, you know, like poker face. And then when they first were when they saw Stephanie and not Lady Gaga. So talk to me about what did you see in her? What was she already doing to prepare herself for something like Adam Factory and for yourself? Um, and then how did the internet play this part in breaking Lady Gaga alongside you? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that worked really well is that, you know, people, people sort of... Um, a lot of people fall apart when, when something bad happens to them. And with Gaga, she had just gotten dropped from Def Jam Records right before I met her, like probably six months before I met her. And, you know, so she spent a year um, on Def Jam, started making a record. They ended up dropping her. And that's scary. So when you all, all of a sudden you have this dream of I want to be the superstar and you do all of this work, you drop out of college to do it. You get signed to a record deal and the record label drops you. Your life is over. You know, is, you feel like it's, it's, it's a tragic moment, especially when she was 19. And, um, and so when we met, you ha she had a certain level of humility and hunger. And when you experience that failure, you never want to feel that again. So I think her level of appreciation for every single moment that we, that we, like every single thing that we did, it was a celebration, you know? So it was like, and I, I, I had just come off a of failure because Eve and I just parted ways like right before I met Gaga. And so- Big breakups yeah, all around. And, and like me and Eve, it's like, it's so funny. We're on text literally right before I got here. Oh, tell her I said hi. <laughs> yeah, yeah so tell I, her I, 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 I love, love her to death still. But, um, she, you know, and so I think both of us coming into those moments, you're coming into it with humility. You're coming into it with a, with a, a lot of appreciation because when you lose something, you really, is, is a special feeling like to regain something. And I think the um, Gaga putting her trust in me when I needed to feel trusted was important to me. So I felt like there was this obligation of working really hard for this girl. And the other piece of it, like she had really great songs. Like she was this really dope songwriter and she was a hustler. So she was going out and doing these little shows in New York. And, um, and you know, she's making her own flyers. She's, you know, she's sitting on the floor breaking up these um, like Disco mirror pieces, pieces yeah. and gluing stuff together for these outfits. And like, she just was such a hustler. I'm like, 
I got like, we got to work together. We got, and, and it didn't work in the beginning. Like it took a while for, you know, for it to pop off. And, but it was a lot of hustle. And when you got, when you got an artist that's willing to work that hard and that's calling you with ideas and doesn't say no to anything. And it's like, Hey, I got you this tour, but it's with new kids on the block. She's like, okay, when do we start? You said the right stuff. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's like, <laughs> she's like, like somebody sent me a picture the other day. It's like it was um, some old picture, and it was like her on a like the bar was the size of the stage that we like we would go play bars. So it's like when you got that kind of hustle and that kind of talent, at some point is gonna work. You just can't stop. You, can, you can't stop. Most people stop before it comes. You just can't stop. It's like that Facebook meme that's always on WhatsApp of the guy like mining and like is super <laughs> close to the diamond yeah, and yeah. then he turns but that, around. That's, that's, the, that's the, the, is the God, the honest truth though. Like, mo- cause it's so hard when you're in it. And like the, the other thing too, that I think was important with, um, with, with, with the dynamic of that relationship and, and not even our relationship specifically, specific to our relationship, but it's um, specific to other uh, six, uh, successful teams that, I, that I've seen form is this sort of, um, we all believe together. And I'm so good at shutting noise out. Like the moment I hear doubt, I don't want to. I don't want to fuck with that. Like you got to be delusional. I, I got. I, I got to turn it off when I'm in that zone because that 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 poison will creep in, and and we already doubt ourselves. You know what I'm saying? So you 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 already have you already have that iota of self doubt. So when you got other people's doubt that compounds on your doubt, chances are it's gonna kill whatever you're working on. So it's like to be able to have that, that group that it's like we lift each other up. When you have your moment, I'm like, I got you. I'm, I'm going to put that battery in your back. That's, that's, that's part of what propelled us to sort of get to that point. Too. And vice versa, right? Because, you know, managers, it's a pretty thankless job. How do you thank yourself? How do you um, measure success for yourself? I got lucky because... I got, I had clients who really thanked me <laughs> like, that's nice. yeah, I got lucky because <laughs> I pick and choose who I want to work with. And so, um, is, 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 is clients who like literally is, it was one guy who pretty big artist, a friend of mine was retiring from management. He asked if I would manage this guy, went, met with the guy. We decided to do it. I fire him on the first day. First day. First day. Because it because and when you ask like the about the 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 ego, like the how how can you be how I'm not a yes person. And it's no one, I never did, I never did anything just for money. So I can't be bought. I can't be bought. One more time, one more time. And, 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 and so if, if we can't have a relationship where we appreciate each other's work and we respect each other, then we don't, we're not going to have a relationship. The difference is, though, when even when I'm on the biggest tours in the world, when we get out on the road and, and, and we pull up to the hotels, a lot of times I'm the first to grab bags when I'm at the venues. I like, if I like, I'll, we're I'll, loading I'll, in. I'll pick, we're up, loading a, I'll pick up equipment. I want to set the tone that is that we're a team. It's like, I'm not at like, and, and, and when people have that spirit. And so the artists that I've worked with that, that we've had the, the best relationships and the most success were incredibly thankful, like to the point where it's like, is, is a certain level of, of, of appreciation and you start to, you, you, you feel each other out and you seek each other out. You know what I'm saying? And so those artists were, were super protective of me. 
the same way I was protective of them. Because trust me, every manager in the world tried to call and steal clients from me. I, like, I, I had artists call me, hey, such and such called me about that. And I told them such and such, such and such. I had artists go to war with people for me. So it's like, so, so I think it's, but I, I've held myself to a standard and I set that tone of this is our partnership. This is our partnership. We. I don't work for you. I work with you. Yeah. I love that. Talk to me a little bit about when an artist is ready for management. I think that's the number one question a lot of independent artists have where they say, oh, if I get a manager, I'm going to start that's getting a, press. That's a good question. If, 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 I'm, if I get a manager, I'm going to start getting bookings. Not knowing that, sure, a junior manager will happily you know, email some venues and, and, you know, pitch your stuff around, but those are all different jobs. That's why there are people with careers in the industry doing each one of these. When it is, when is an artist ready? It's always the chicken or the egg, but what are the tall tale signs of you got something to manage? So, so like the advice, the advice I've given most artists, one, that's a really good question and I don't have a great answer for it. Sick. <laughs> But, um, but the ant, like the closest I could say, um, is, is that I, I tell a lot of artists that, that come to me, don't go for the biggest, most well-known managers. Mm -hmm. And even artists that are like taken off that, 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 that'll call me about this and they're getting ready to go meet with managers, I'll, I'll, I'll tell them, I say, okay, you're meeting with such and such? This is the question to ask them. If I call you and XYZ calls you at the same time, who phone call are you gonna take? If I'm starting my tour the same day as XYZ is starting their tour, whose show are you gonna go to? You know, and I know the answer to it already, it's like, is, you know, we call it one queen per hive. You know, you're going to go like you, every, every manager has that main client. What I found though, is that, um, most of my sort of friends who become really big managers, they started off as not really big managers. Somebody trusted them and they really cared about somebody that they were representing and they really and they put the work in to learn the business. So sometimes you could have that friend who is really smart, you really trust, they really have your back, and they they're gonna work their behinds off to learn the business. And you gotta have the patience and loyalty to them to give them the opportunity to grow and 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 keep leveling up. And what I, where I got the benefit from both like a, a, an, an Eve at my early career and, and Gaga at a mid career, I didn't know anything when I, when I met Eve. I knew stu some stuff about the music industry, but now all of a sudden I'm a real manager and I got to meet with like people who've been in this business for 20 years. And I'm from I, like, I was super rough around the edges. And then, you know, I, I, after seven years at Eve, I, I did a lot. You know, we did TV shows and clothing line. Like, we did a lot. She accomplished a lot. But then what I realized when, I, when, when Gaga took off, I'm like, there's levels to this. I'm in a whole different stratosphere. I got to learn. So, what is sync? What is this? What is, yeah. but, but what it was is that when you got that level of superstar, this isn't, this is selling multiple stadiums in countries I've never heard of before and, and, and dealing in currencies I've never dealt with before and routing 747 jets of equipment and putting, you know, 25 tractor trailers out on the road. It's managers who had done that for Rolling Stones and the Eagles and all of these bands for 20-something years and, and that she could have gone to that had called her. And she gave me that opportunity to grow into that. So that's the type of artist 
that if you're an artist, that's the type of artist you want to be. Um, and that's the type of um, opportunities that you want to give somebody. But they got to be responsible on their end to, and grow into it. But it's like, that's, the, that's, that's, that's how you build each other. I love that. So you evolve with your artist in real time. If I'm not learning, I quit. Yeah, I got, yeah, because I'm like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, if, if I'm not going to learn, I'm not going to keep my job. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing the artist a disservice. So my job was to stay way ahead of that artist. I'm like, I'm learning it way before they even asked me about it. And I love that you brought up Eve going from music, but then to movies and TV. And I actually had here to talk about um, what it's like developing a business model like that, because when it comes to Eve and Gaga, who we know now from all the way from Poker Face up to like Shallow and like A Star is Born, um, it's, it's the mold for what a female artist can do, is like, um, can aspire to. Um, so how do you establish those multiple streams of income? How do you cast that vision um, and set it in stone to make them grow? Yeah, it's, it's very artist specific. And, you know, we, on, we only we start with the music It's always about the music and the music is core to, core to whatever we do. And then it is based off of like, what are you interested in? You know, so so, you know, some artists only do. I've worked with some artists who only want to do music. That's the only thing they care about. They only want to do music. And um, and then you got some artists who are like. I want to do fashion and, and, you know, or I want to do fragrance and I want to do, you know, um, real estate or text. Yeah. Like, you know, so like, so, so, and, and for me, I'm, I'm, I think that the, the combination of my, my, my ADHD and, and curiosity, when somebody tells me they want to do something, I'm so eager to try to figure it out. Hyper fixated. Uh, I'm like, oh, I'm going to oh, go God. down that rabbit hole. It's, it's the good mental illness part where you're yes. just like, yes, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it until 4 a.m. Put me to work. Get a therapist. Put, put, we'll get through it. We're fine. Put me to work. Yeah. Um, amazing. So, you know, when we talk about uh, development and especially as females, um, talk to me about being a male manager managing female artists. Um, how do you come to the table with an understanding? What can other managers do that um, provide services and manage female artists? I think that's really important to really kind of put on the table and be like, we're talking about a business behind your freedom and your sexuality and, you know, what you're excited about and all your art. You know, how do you come correct to that? You know, I got lucky because I, I grew up with all aunts. <laughs> and so... Me, my preference has always been to manage female artists. And um, it, it's just the, it's a, the, the relationship dynamic has always been great. Um, I'm probably, I, I didn't have sisters growing up. So like, and so it, the relationship that f always formed was like a brother sister relationship. And so, and, and that level of protection was always like, you know, a, a, a brother, sister. And so I, I think that dynamic just worked really, really well for me. And the male artist that I work with, I, it, when it's like John Legend, um, we, we really matched intellectually, like the stuff we would talk about offline and like stuff we cared about, it was like super, super aligned. So just sort of finding that alignment and then with the with the women, the the hard hardest part that I found is like we deal. You got you got levels to it because you got one level of somebody is gonna gonna say or do something super disrespectful, you know, like come at this artist a certain type of way, and you know and. So we gotta we gotta put a lot of protection around that artist to make sure that they feel safe, whether it's in a recording studio, because there's a lot of moments where artists that I work with didn't so feel vulnerable. safe. So vulnerable, like that's that gotta be for and for for any artist, but for a female artist, that studio has to be your safest place. That's where the work starts. So, and and what. It's so many similarities now. I'm thinking about it even with Eve and Gaga. Like, you're talking about 
two super strong females, but strong from a musical point of view. So Eve going into the studio, she's going in with Dr. Dre, who's like probably one of the most, not even one of, probably the most successful um, producer in hip hop history. And musically, it's like sonically, Dre's ear is like, you got like sort of Quincy Jones generation, then you got Dr. Dre. like The analog versus yeah, digital. Yes. Like, and then like and Rick Rubin's probably the only other person I sort of put in that category. But for Eve to feel comfortable enough to debate with Dr. Dre around how she wants a record to sound, we got to give her that confidence. We got to protect her. We got, she has to know, because if, if something doesn't go her way, she has to know I got her back. But she has to feel safe in that space to speak up and, and with her, from, a, from a creative standpoint. So that's one level of safety. Um, most, most of these women are really producers. They just don't get the credit. I watch, I watch these women fix records and add value and like, and they, and, and people didn't want to give them credit on stuff. So that's one level of safety. Then you have the, the, the physical level of safety. Like, it, cause if you, if you're in the studio and only th and, and you got to worry about every dude that's coming in there coming at you every every second like you know every single and you're moment you're at work yeah at work <laughs> just so you got to be you got to be in a mo in the moment of creating not protecting you know what i'm saying fight or flight as an art does not work yeah, so we we you know we we built real protection systems around 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 artists where they felt extremely safe and and people know like we've we've gotten I've gotten CEOs fired from their jobs, by the way. Like, I got, I've gotten CEOs fired from their jobs for doing some disrespectful stuff or thank, saying something disrespectful. Thank you for being an advocate. That's really awesome. I mean, I think about myself as a host, but also working out front, but also being admin. And then I think about, you know, as managers, how we are taking care of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs um, in real time to make sure that people feel physically protected, sheltered, fed, <laughs> so they can do the best they, they can do. So thank you so much. I mean, I'm already learning so, so much, but then I remember you were like, I left management. <laughs> so it's like, I'm, great, I'm a, I'm a but, retired but what's next? Mm, retired. You know? um, talk to me about after Adam Factory, after um, the, the management that you did with Eve and Gaga and all these huge names, um, it was onto a bigger company. So how did you take that one-on-one -on -one approach that you once had with artists and bring it to a brand new global table? Yeah, it was, it, it was interesting, but you know, um, when, when, um, this is probably 2015, through about 2015, I realized I was losing my passion for management and was crazy. We ended up um, having, I had more, I had more number ones that within that two year span than I had in my entire career. And I wasn't happy. And we had just broken Megan Trainer. She, she got like best new artist, Charlie Poof had see you again that just exploded around the world. And I was struggling with management like because like where before I was just super excited. It was something that like I just I, I was a manager. That, that's all I like in my mind. I'm, I'm a manager. I started thinking about and, and by that time I started doing a ton of um, early stage technology investments. So I got really interested in tech. I spent a ton of time with founders. And, um, and I was building out this portfolio. And so, and one of, one of our early stage investments was Spotify. And so uh, Daniel Leck, who's the founder, he and I become friends and I was an advisor for the company. And he called me up and asked if I would consult on this project where um, they, were, they wanted to figure out how do they work directly with artists. And, and he had this artist in mind and he asked if I would do it. So we started modeling it out and spending time. 
And that conversation sort of turned into, wow, what if we, what if, what if I went inside of Spotify and helped build out this division and we named this division Creator Services? And, um, and I decided to stop doing management at that point. Um, ended up going inside of Spotify. It was the most terrifying decision that I, I, I could make. I changed my mind like three times during the process and um, as I was going in. And because uh, reason being, my, my identity was really closely associated with me being a manager for big stars. That was like part of, that was part of my identity. And, um, and then the other piece of it was I knew how to do management really, really well. And, and, and the third piece of it was being an entrepreneur was so, so closely tied with my identity and now I was going to go work for somebody. And I never had, I never really had a job before. It was a resume. Like. Yeah. It's like I did stuff. You know what I'm saying? But like, stuffing things, yeah. yeah. Stuffing things for people. For right? people, yeah. But it was like, Humans, people, yeah. But not a, not a company company. And, but Daniel, Daniel's 10 years younger than me, but he was always, throughout our relationship, he was always somebody who gave me wise advice. Like, he, he's probably, people have no clue how brilliant this guy is. So, one of the things I'd, I said to myself was I could learn so much from Daniel. And, um, and so that was one of the big reasons. So when I went in, it was, I realized how, how much I sucked at managing people <laughs> because Swedish people know how to manage and they know how to build process. That's yeah, why Ikea. Ikea, come on. <laughs> 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 They're meatballs. Wow. They're H&M, cabinets. H&M, Incredible. H&M, Ikea, all that. But, like, but they, 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 I learned how, I learned, I learned how to build a company. Simplicity. And process. How do you take creative, how do you take creative and layer on um, processes on top of creative without it killing the creativity? And, um, and, they're, and they're really good at it. And so I ended up going in and what I, what I realized was I could work with artists in a much, much bigger way than I was working with artists in the past. And I could work with any artist in the world that I want to work with. You know, so all of a sudden I can go and, you know, be in the studio with, um, with Sal in the weekend and, and figure out creative ways to, to work on now. the album. Yeah, exactly. Able. It, it, and then, um, or I can uh, work with Taylor Swift, or I can work with this person, I can work with this person. And it was super fulfilling to be able to, um, one, you know, help the company go to another level. But also, I came in at a time where people didn't know what streaming was. And so to really switch people out of Apple downloads and the iTunes store over to, hey, every time, because what people, people still don't understand it, and I can't understand why people complain, but, you know, it used to be, before we launched this thing, somebody bought your song on iTunes, you got paid that one time. You get paid every time somebody listens now. So when, you, so when we started educating the industry and artists on that part of it, I just told my team, I said, print out the math that show people, because I got to show these people how, like, over a 10-year period, how much you're going to make off of this song versus this, this, the 99 cents that you're going to make here so they can start understanding why they should put the their longevity. content on there. Yeah. And, and audience, too. So all, and what people didn't know was if you weren't on Spotify, you didn't exist in, in, in Scandinavia, any, any of the Nordic territories, certain parts of Europe, you were non-existent because 90% of the population didn't listen to radio, weren't on iTunes, and was only on Spotify. And so, so just this whole th- shift. And now, you know, it's, it's, we, I just try to live around the corner on so what's coming next? What's sort of, what's, what's post-streaming? What's post this? What's post that? So what are some processes that your team did? Like, what is creator services 
and why, you know, on a bigger level, was it important for you to be in that role and to develop it into what it is today? Um, you, you know, one of the reasons why, why Daniel, um, why we worked so well together was Spotify really understands technology. They really understand technology. They didn't quite understand artists that well. And is with me being a with me being a manager, you understand artists in a different way than somebody who came from a record label or came from this place or came from that place because we worked on every sort of facet of an artist's career. So I understand what the manager's problems are. Like I understand what your decision making process is going to be when you're putting this album out or like I made a rule when I went into the company because when I first went in, first guy I met was um, a guy, Tuma Basa, who created Rap Caviar. So my first couple of weeks there, I'm in the New York office and I, I see DJ Drama walking through. So, you know, I knew Drama and this guy, Tuma's with him and I'm like, oh, it's Rap Caviar. So he's like, oh, I'm getting ready to go listen to, to Drama's album. So they go into the conference room and, and, and Tuma puts a, a, this Bluetooth speaker on. And I said, you, you're listening to the drama album on that? Yeah, it sounds like you download it on LimeWire, put it through a potato, like it, it's not the same. So what Tuma told me is that this is how it was set up around the world for their listening sessions. So I went to, to, to the team and I said, I want to redo every music room around the world because if my artists did 11 versions of that mix and they set up all night long and like, I remember I was managing Miguel and we went to a meeting at Shazam and we left the meeting because they wanted to play it on some bullshit speaker. I'm like, we're not going to do that. So I want to honor the artist's work and respect their, respect their work. So I'm gonna play it on, I, I ordered the, the, the best speakers you could find, I put in those offices. And as little things like that. When I, I would go into meetings and the, the artists would come in and people would be listening to the music or on their laptops or phones, I made it, you, I, you could not look at your phone or bring your computer in that room if there's an artist playing their music. Show them some respect. Like, listen, like, really, because they're vulnerable. Like, they, like, for me to play my music, like, I know how my artists think. They're going to... It's the happy birthday they, all they, over again. You're just kind of like... They're, they're going to watch your reaction when, to, to how you listen to that song. So it's like, so if you're on your computer or phone or whatever, that, that's signaling. So it's all of those little things. So, where, so I, I, I help Spotify become an artist centric company that has like where where like how do you how do you approach the role with empathy for for, for the artist and not to say you know it's these are technology companies at the end of the day and it's like you know and I still you know I love I love Spotify Lo love them to death, but you know, they, it's still stuff they got to work through with that. Absolutely. And then was that the evolution of Spotify for artists or was that a new venture? So, so they were, they were working on, they were building Spotify for artists when I, when I came in and one of the things, you know, come in and within my role and coming from being a manager, one of the things I was, I was, I, I said to the team building it was I would need access to it. Cause they were, it was only for the artists. So nobody else had access to it. So I said, I'm going to be the person that's looking at this. So I, I need access and I need the label to have access because my product manager needs to see this data. So it was this combination of being able to bring artists in to, to, to tell the tech team, this is how we work. And this is what our workflow looks like. And this is, these are the, these are the things that would be important to us within the product. Incredible. I mean, how does it feel to be, you know, probably part of the backbone of like so many important decisions made people who are able to book and, you know, pitch themselves because they have the data, you know, um, I just think that's really impressive and probably one of the apps that I check the most <laughs> after 11 a.m. 
um, just checking what's going on because having that pulse as a manager, it can feel good, but it has to look good too. Yep, yep. Um, so that's really important. Thank you so much. Um, of course. And now we're not at Spotify. So where are we now? I'm really excited to talk about Venice and everything that's going on. Yeah, you know, when I, when, when, I, when I was at Spotify, one of the things I saw coming in was this big disparity. Like I never worked with, um, uh, on the independent label side. You know, most of our artists were signed to majors. So I, I didn't really know a lot about that space. So coming in, that was a gap that I needed to fill. And, um, and when I was sitting down with like a lot of the independent label owners, I was seeing like, oh, wow, this is, they're getting a the short end of the stick on a lot of stuff. And then I started sitting down with a lot of um, self-released artists who were releasing through like, um, it, this is when Philip was launching um, DistroKid. And um, so sitting down with Philip and learning about that space, and I started, I started working with our internal team on building these tools for independent artists. How can we help them sort of directly upload to Spotify or get payment, payments faster, like all of these things? And when major labels saw what we were working on, they freaked out because they knew what it was going to mean. You know, like, so all of a sudden, when, when independent artists can um, be on the same level as major artists, it takes away power from somebody. So we, we ended up not being able to build what we wanted to build because labels felt like it was competitive. So when I left, um, I spoke with, with, with Daniel and some of my team at Spotify and told them what I was going to work on, which I'm... Um, it was start out with distribution for independent artists, being able to give them the same level of service that they would get at a major label. So, so like it shouldn't feel any different. Empathy, but also data. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, 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 but, but very experienced people, people who know what success looks like. Because in the independent music space, one of the things that I saw was, you didn't see, there were no big superstars. And, you know, an artist would get here and the independent label would feel like that's, the, that's success. And in our world, it was like, no, we want to aim for the here, you know? And so why cap an artist here? Like, how do the we aim ceiling. here? Yes. And then, so in the independent space coming in, we knew the bar was, was so low for what success looked like we felt like we, can, we, could, we could at least put together a team that knew what global stardom felt like. So that was the sort of first layer. Can we build services? Then we started building out the software. And so, okay, you got to have data. You got to have payments. You got to have royalty splits. You got to have all of these things. And then now we're incorporating things like um, you got to be able to manage your fan base. So can you build a CRM system where people can email all their fans, separated by cities, zip codes, all of those things. Um, can you do your Shopify integrations? Can you do all, everything within one platform so that um, so you, you, you know how much money you're making, you know where all of your stuff is, all of your data is? And then on top of that, can you do that and have a community of other like-minded people around you that's going through the same things that you're going through. Sounds familiar. Yes, because like it's community. Community, community is so important because with community, you share information, you share experiences, you don't feel alone. And most of the time in the independent space, is that being an artist, it could feel so isolating at times. So isolating. So it's like, so to remove that isolation, to give people um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on. Um, is like, can we give access to information? Because that's the thing where it's like, it's so much um, information asymmetry out there that the music industry is so unnecessarily complex. It's stupid. Like if I had to rebuild the music industry all over, it wouldn't look anything like uh, it the, looks. The kiss, uh, keep it simple, stupid. It's you like, know? why is it so complicated? And, and, and it's, and it's so complicated in different parts of the world. 
So it's like, I think this generation of independent artists can remove that complexity. It's like, why do splits need to look a certain way? Why do songwriters not participate in the master? Why don't, like, you know, there's all of these whys. So, you know, so we try to open up the conversation um, that, to allow artists to, l to learn more, um, to, to being able to give artists um, advice that, and that they wouldn't have access to. You know what I'm saying? Like, we know stuff that's happening next year that no, people don't know about right now, but that the major labels may know about that they can start preparing for, but the, but independent artists will be so far behind the eight ball that, you know, they, they'll never be able to catch up. So what I understand from it, it's like, yo, there's only so far your arms can reach as an artist. There's only so far, you know, your far your arms can reach as a manager, as a junior manager, but you know, Venice music and just the infrastructure of again, empathy data meets like community is able to like extendo that in real time. And I yeah. think, you know, it becomes then also like the Baskin Robin of things where now there's like so much to learn and so many options, you know, you don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. So where can someone start to learn more about their business? Imagine they don't have a manager and they just want to start going from being an artist or recording artist to a business, a creative entrepreneur. Where do they start on a platform like Venice? Yeah, I, I think it's, um, I wouldn't say start with, with Venice, by the way. I just would be, I would want to know everything there's to know about whatever field that I'm in. Because the more you know, the more you can keep everybody honest about whether or not they're doing their jobs right. So it's like, you know, so if you're with a distribution company, you should know about distribution, you know, and, and how it works. You should know how you get paid. You should know um, how rates work. Cause that's just, those, those are simple things to, to learn, to learn about. And, um, and, and so being able to ask the right questions and keep people honest about their jobs. What I'm t like, I would tell people like, Partners would, would come and wanting wanting to meet with certain artists that I managed, and specifically, specifically with Gaga and John. And I didn't manage Will Will Smith, but you know I worked with Will for years, and Will's in that same category. But I would tell people before they meet, you better know everything there is to know before you walk into Don't that room. Don't look at me, yeah. Because they're, they're going to ask you every single question. Like, because, you know, we, we're meeting, these are Fortune 500 company executives coming to meet with the artists, and they're used to meeting with artists who aren't going to ask questions. One example, we, we were having a meeting with um, uh, Cody Fragrance Company out of France. And, uh, out of, yeah, France. And they, want, they wanted uh, Gaga to do a fragrance. And she really didn't want to do a fragrance, but they wanted the picture. So we set the meeting up. So they, they have the meeting. We're in this conference room. And um, she said, OK, I, I'll do the fragrance. I got one condition. The guy say, say what? She said, I want it to be black. I want the fragrance to be black. And I see them look at each other. And they're saying, okay, okay, we'll try to figure this out. So we leave out the room, and then the guy, you know, he pulls me aside, the CEO. He says, Troy, it is it's impossible to do a, people spray it on their clothes. You can't do a black fragrance. Someone call Houston, yeah. yeah it's like, you can't do it. I said, she's not going to do the fragrance then. I said, she's not going to do it. So... Weeks go by, months go by, whatever. They come back for our second meeting, and he pulls out this bottle, and it's a, and it's a black fragrance. And he sprays it. He has a white shirt on, a white dress shirt, and he sprays it on his shirt. So he says, we found this, uh, I didn't even know this terminology, but the spray thing that it comes through is, is called the actuator. He said, we found the actuator that breaks down the chemicals um, as it comes through, where it sprays on clear. 
She already knew that shit. <laughs> she knew already. So when you that type of artist that studies and understands and knows your business, people can't pull one over on you. People can't pull it over on you. So that's the type of artist that you want to be. You want to be curious, but you, Oprah Winfrey signs her own checks. You know what I'm saying? Like Oprah, Oprah got a lot of money and a lot of checks. She, she knows her business, though. You know what I'm saying? So it's like that, that, that's the level of artist that, that, that you, that you want to be. Thank you. That was incredibly insightful. Now, let's give it up for that. We were a little quiet over there. They were chewing on it. Um, but you and me right now, right? So let's, let's look into the crystal ball. You and me, Miss Cleo, you know the vibes. <laughs> what is next for you? What is, what is next in this industry? What is next for you? I'm focused on, on Venice right now. Like, you know, f for me, it's, you know, how we, I, I was talking about, like, going down the rabbit hole. And like, this is my Mack truck through the cul-de-sac. Like, cause it's, it's, and honestly, it's bigger than Venice for me. Is like where I talk to, I talk to like Steve Stout, who um, has a, a company called United Masters. And, um, and Steve and I are, are, are friends. And um, Philip from DistroKid is, is, is a buddy I know. And, Ghazi, who, who runs Empire, and um, Larry Jackson has Gamma. These are people who, they, who people with, on the outside, people would say, oh, those are, those are your competitors. I talk to them all the time. Reason being is we're trying to fix a much bigger problem. We can compete against each other, but the problem is independent music and independent artists. And so we need to fix the ecosystem. So Venice to me is a means to an end to fix the ecosystem. And then from there, it's like, I'll figure out what I'm, what I'm going to do next. But, you know, if, if I got to look back, you know, 10 years, 10 years from now, looking back, I think it would be, it wouldn't just be Venice being successful as much as it is, you know, it's certain areas that I find in my life where I can see, okay, I made impact here or I made impact here. This is an area that I actually want to be able to make some real impact because I, because that, that is actually is bigger, is much, much, much bigger than, because if I, if Venice was successful, but yet the industry still, still failing, I honestly wouldn't feel like I really did it. I, I'd be kind of fake doing it. Well, Troy, you've made impact from the second you stepped on stage to the second thank, you started sharing you, with us. You. Can we please give it thank up for Troy? Thank you. Y'all, for our people inside of the camera, this is Scarlett Estelle with Troy Carter here at Creator Talk, artist friendly and creator first. Let's give it up for Troy one more time. Let's give it up for y'all. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all, some house rules. We're going to keep it going. Uh, two things. Um, if you are able-bodied and able to start clearing up the chairs, we do want to take a group photo. Um, oh, yes, let's actually do some Q&A. We got some time. So let's pass around the mic. Let's give it up for Ramel. Let's go. Awesome. We're going to do some Q&A. Thank you. Good evening. Just want to say thank you so much for all of the wisdom that was shared. My name is Namara, and my question is regarding independent artists and licensing in sync music. Um, I had a few questions that I've uh, that I've fielded for folks about how much import how important it is for us to know our metadata and how to actually pitch the songs that we have released um, that are already out versus the ones that we haven't yet to release. Because I'm often told, you know, when it comes to licensing and syncing, you don't necessarily want to pitch the music that's already out there. You want to pitch the music that you've already built up. So how much of that is true, and how does metadata play in that? Um, that's not true at all, by the way. OK, great. <laughs> if, I, if, if I'm an independent artist, um, and I don't care which one of my songs they pick. And the beautiful thing about Sync is it is it's so much content that's being created right now in terms of film, television, games, 
um, you know, all, all like uh, commercials is all of these different uh, areas, right? And for music supervisors, the most important thing is cleanliness. Can you make it as simple for them as possible? Uh, do, do, they don't want to go through 50 million people to clear something. If you could do a one-stop shop clearance, you make, make it so, so much easier for people to make a decision. Um, and because and, they, they don't want to have to call 50 different publishers and all of those, th those things. Um, is the, the metadata is great to have, by the way, because I, I just think long term um, anyway, and especially with like AI and just new content platforms that, 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 that are emerging, um, having as much metadata as possible is, is super important. Um, people aren't necessarily like the certain decisions in terms of uh, tempo, genre, like, you know, they'll, they'll make decisions based off of that. Um, but a lot of times people are making decisions off of feel. How, how does it feel for this particular scene? And, 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 um, and X, Y, Z. The great thing about, um, the other great thing about sync is it evens the playing field and it actually can give independent artists a bigger advantage over, uh, over major label artists. Cause a lot of times it's just like, does the song make sense for the, for, for the scene? Um, can we get this for a cheap price? Versus having to pay for something that costs, you know, millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars or whatever. And for most independent artists, it's like they're looking for exposure, you know, like because you getting a sink in something is going to help drive these other things. What a lot of people don't know is for the first year of Gaga's business, it was all it was 100 uh, percent. It was 100 percent driven by sync. 100 percent. So Sony ATV, we gave them her album um, way before the album came out, and we just had them pitching songs like crazy. And they just would get songs placed in this trailer for this, this thing for this, this thing for this. And that money is what kept things going to. And then also it gave exposure and it gave us a story to be able to tell people for as we were pitching her for other things. So like... I would, I would figure out, if I was sitting in the, in the seat of an independent artist, I would find out who all of these music supervisors are, both small and big. I would figure out how to contact them and, and start building a, build a relationship. Like, even as reach out, um, how can I make your job easier? I have song, I have one-stop shop songs. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a hungry artist. These are the projects I know that you work on. And these are the songs that I, I feel like will work for what you do. Because people will respect the fact that you know their work, that you follow them, that you understand what they do. And chances are um, you, somebody's going to give you a response. And, and out of those responses, you might get a shot. Hey, Troy. Um, my name is Kenny White. I, um, I remember you as little less coming through our shows that we did back in the 90s. And uh, I just wanted you to know. I don't know little less, though. I know you. I know, oh, not little less. I'm sorry. Uh, but you know, little less. A little is, more. Huh? I'm sorry. Little, um, li little less is uh, freeway. <laughs> so, oh, less. 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 I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But little Troy, I remember you coming through our shows. And I noticed how focused you were always. And I just knew that one day I would sit in a room where you were giving a talk. I watched your TED Talks, oh, but you. I wanted to actually come here. I'm quite I'm a lot older than all of these people in here right now, but I wanted to come here and actually sit down and hear, your, hear what you have to say and talk about your business. And, and I just want everyone to know that this is one person that I saw that was focused on what it was that he wanted. And um, I, I, it, it's, it happened. So thank, I just want to say, appreciate you know, thank you. Troy. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But when you say Les, I, uh, I'm like, who's Les? Leslie. Oh, no, <laughs> freeway. Yeah, yeah freeway. freeway. Les. I'm Leslie. Yeah, he was the first one on, my, on one of my showcases. Wow. I love wow. I love Freeway. You a legend too. Damn. Right over there. <laughs> right over here in the white. 
Uh, yeah, thank you so much for sharing all these gems. I wanted to ask if you could walk us through the the Troy Carter toolkit of meeting resistance. How do you uh, meet resistance and navigate that? Yeah, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, you know, I, I, I was sitting with um, some producers in LA yesterday and we ended up having a two hour conversation around mental health and like, you know, really, really honest conversation, you know, cause what we do, you know, you, 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 we're putting ourselves in vulnerable positions. When you follow your dreams, you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable position. And cause it's not like showing up for a job that's sort of where you're told what to do. And you know, it's, it's like a lot of structure and it's not it, like, if you do what you're told, you sort of succeed to last, you know, another week, another year or whatever at your job and, you know, still get paid. It's, it's, it's easy in that sense of structure. And, but when you're following your dreams and you really believe in something and you want it so bad, it's scary. And you get that, th that thing in your stomach and it's a lot, and it's, and it's fear, fear creeps in and anxiety creeps in. And, you know, where, where I'm, I'm lucky that I really love what I do and I care about what I do. And that helps me get through the rough patches. Like it makes it worth, it's, it's worth it. And, and cause if it's, if it's, if it's not worth it, we quit when it gets hard, you know, but I think the, um, for the specific toolkit, meditation helped me tremendously. Like I went through depression, um, and this is around 2007 and I, I never knew what depression was. Like people didn't talk about this stuff. And, and I, I like, it was the one moment in my life where it was, I was noticeably unhappy for extended periods of time. And I felt low, low, low. And I started, somebody introduced me to meditation and I started doing meditation. And this is before people even talked about meditation. I thought this dude was crazy when he was telling me about it. And, uh, and I went and it actually was game changing for me. It was really, really game changing for me. And I think being able to, um, and then one other piece I would add on to it, that's probably one of the most important lessons that I learned. A coach was telling me, she said, she said, look back on any, any moment in your life where, you've, you, where you had sort of some inflection point of, of luck or success. And really think about it, write it down, and tell me what, exactly what you had to do with it. And the reality was, I didn't have much to do with it. <laughs> and, 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 it, it that, and, and what I mean by that is like, I can hustle, I can show up and I can do the work, but then somebody introduces me to Gaga or a lawyer that I met with five years ago who we kept in touch with over the years called me randomly to represent the Prince's state. Like, like, it's just stuff where I couldn't have said, okay, this is going to be my strategy to represent Prince Estate, or I'm going to discover this artist who I don't even know who she is, I don't even know she, she exists, and, and this is going to happen. It doesn't work that way. So that made me start really understanding faith and trust. And, you know, some people call it the universe, some people call it God, some people call it uh, Allah, some people call it, wh whatever you want to call it, whatever you believe in is a relationship that you form between yourself and, and that bigger power. And it, that's the thing people, like we want so much, we want so much control over everything that, and, and, and it doesn't work that way. So and, and then the, the, the last piece I would say about it is, is all part 
of is 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 all part of the journey and that was really 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 hard for me to learn because a lot of a lot of really bad stuff you know and and I'm calling it bad with like sort of quotation marks but um a, like a lot of bad things happened throughout my life and my career that if they didn't happen certain things would have never happened you know and so but in the moments while they were happening, it felt like the worst possible thing that could actually happen. The worst thing. And so those are the, like, so when things get, get tough, I got to go to that quiet place and like, and I, and, and I, I thank God for whatever I'm going through. And I am like, my, my sort of personal prayer is allow, show me what you're teaching me right now. Like, a, a, allow me to recognize what I'm supposed to learn in this particular moment. And when, when I, like, it's, it's Tyler Perry, you know, talks a lot about um, sleeping in his car and, and, you know, and some of the stuff that he went through and him being told no about certain things. If somebody would have told that guy yes in that particular moment, he might be in there on the writer's strike right now, being a, you know, a, a TV writer in the picket line right now. But, it, but that moment forced him to write his own scripts and, and put up his own plays and those things or whatever. So just put yourself in those shoes in your particular, in your particular moment and, and is, is never, is, and, and it, it it's going to sound easy for me to say and not knowing any particular situation you might go through at any moment. It's never as bad as we think it is. It's never as bad as we think it is. And what we fear is, is never as bad as what it turns out to be. It, it never turns out that bad. Where's like the funk flex bomb? Like that's crazy. Hey, how's it going? My name is Aksh Bhakti. I'm right here. <laughs> um, so my question for you is um, the future of copyright and your perspective on the new marketplace for AI driven music and how human assisted artificial intelligence could shape the landscape of music and how do you see that shaping up? I think it's going to be very, very, very interesting. Um, if, we're, if, we, if we fast forward out let's call it seven years from now, seven to 10 years. And if we look at Billboard Hot 100, my guess is at least 50% of the songs on there are gonna be by artists who you won't be able to differentiate between whether they're a real person or not. That'll be, a, and those, that 50% will be 100% AI created. And I'm not talking about the sort of fake Drake, fake weekend sort of thing. Um, we'll, we'll be at the point, and this is it, it, within the next, 12, the next 12 months, where the level of the level of technology that exists right now We'll be able to, the AI will be able to create a, a unique voice that's not, you know, one, another artist's voice, um, create a track that's just as good or not better than most of the, 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 the stuff that's in the charts right now, create a song around it. But the, the magic trick is, and what we, what we see in AI right now that we've been experimenting with and, and the, the, the artist will develop its own personality. So it's not like, you know, like where um, Trevor has like little Michaela and you got a sort of team behind it, the sort of virtual character, the character is going to create itself. And where, and so if you're a fan, you're going to be able to interact with this artist in a way where you won't be able to differentiate whether you're talking to a real artist on the other side of it. And then the technology exists today, right now, where if they're playing live, you wouldn't be able to tell that's not a real person on that stage. I just went to see um, ABBA 
the band ABBA, uh, their, their show in London. And it was mind, the technology that they used, I thought it was, I'm like, there that, that has to be people on stage right now. Gorillas that, is somewhere just like punching the air. Like it, it, it is nuts. I've never seen anything like this before. And so when you, when you could combine that sort of projection technology with this, with, with, with AI, this sort of AI crea creation, it's going to get very, very, very interesting. So, so to the question about copyright, whoever controls that, 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 that AI and, and that sort of whatever, I don't even know what it's going to be called yet in terms of, let's call it an AI label of, of characters that you sort of programmed of this is what I want these artists to be. This is what I want their personalities to be like. This is the genre I wanted to operate in. And you just push go and they start creating themselves. So question then becomes, you, are you the copyright owner of, of the, that material? And then separately, what we're dealing with right now in real time, like with the fake stuff and, 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 this, and specifically in America, we're lucky enough in America where we have strong copyright laws. Um, the biggest problem with the fake Drake, fake Weekend song is there's no copyright violation. So when the labels sent their takedown notices to all the streaming uh, platforms, what people don't know is the streaming platforms didn't have to take it down. They did it voluntarily. But, they, but the person didn't break copyright laws because they didn't steal the song. So, so when, then it's something called, uh, in different states have what you call right of publicity laws. So with right of publicity, I can't take, like we dealt with, with Prince Estate. It was like a Prince cover band that was using some of Prince's IP or whatever. And, and we had to go after them through right of publicity. And because they, they can't use Prince's image in a way where people can't differentiate. But the record labels don't own the right of publicity. So the artist has to go after that. So are the artists going to be able to spend the money that needs to be spent to go after every single right of publicity that comes up, especially independent artists, if you're not making a ton of money you know, to, to do that? And then the biggest problem that's going to happen right now is that um, the, a the way AI works, if, if, if anybody doesn't know, like ChatGPT and OpenAI, what they basically did, they just spent years scraping the internet for all of these different data samples. So that's copyright violation. <laughs> you know, so if you, you actually sample somebody's work. So we feel like in America, there, there's going to be, a, there's already a bunch of lawsuits happening in real time, especially like in the fine art world around this. And so we feel like it's going to be protections there. But then once you go into certain parts of Latin America, issues, no, like no real strong copyright laws. China, what, what's a copyright? Like, so you, you're going you're gonna to go through all of these places. So that's where, well, you know, as we're talking about staying educated, just stay up on, like, just Google this stuff. Just kind of stay up on it so that that way you just kind of always understand what your rights are, or what your clients' rights are um, as, a, as a creator or entrepreneur. Okay, we're going to do two more questions. Um, I'll give it to a woman. So. Hey, Angelina. Amazing to see you and everybody. Thanks so much, Troy and Scarlett. My question is about Venice music. I'm excited to release my next song with you. Nice, yes. nice. Thank you. I want to ask about the artist manager strategy sessions in a, a professional tier. How often um, do you plan to like host those? We do ours once. We do ours once a month with me and my co-founder Susie, and then. Um, but throughout each week, we have um, somebody from our team that's given talks on any different subject that it may be. 
So, um, so they're pretty much weekly. But me and Susie, we do it once a month. That's amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Welcome to Venice. Hi, uh, I guess we're all standing up. Um, I want to go back to like page three of this conversation where you were talking about Philadelphia doesn't quite have the infrastructure. I just wanted to see if you could dive a little deeper in that. Like, where have you been that makes you say, man, I wish Philly had this, whether it's physical or virtual? So, yeah. Yeah, I think. Um I would, so I would, throw virtu I would throw the virtual piece out the window with this in particular thing, because I, I do think you need um, physical proximity. And Nashville is a good example. So where you have a bunch of different record labels, a bunch of different publishers, um, and an, uh, within enough density where you can go from one place to another pretty easily. So if a, a so if an artist wanted to come in town to do um, to 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 do me, do meetings essentially, they got multiple people that they that they can meet with. Or if you discover somebody, if you discover an artist in Philly, there's no reason why they should ever need to leave Philly to 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 sign with a, a manager or or a record label. So it's like so, but there there's this sort of um, and that's, and that's why I think this is important, by the way. Like, th like, literally where we are right now is important because if you can have some sort of infrastructure that if you're a manager that you could plug into and, and you go, you're working out of here and then there's another manager that's doing the same thing and another manager that's doing the same thing. And as you grow, you stay. As you grow, you stay. As you grow, you build. As you grow, you reinvest back into the city, not just in the music part of the city, but like what's your relationship with mayor or, or, or civic organizations or like, because all of it is part of this ecosystem. So like Atlanta, for instance, Atlanta took advantage of, um, of, of like all of a sudden the governor, uh, uh, Georgia governor, I was able to get tax tax breaks for creatives. So they, people started using it for movies and music videos and, you know, content and those things. So that's the relationship between the, the local entrepreneurs and government to say, Hey, we need incentives to stay, but we also need incentives to, to bring more people in. Canada is another place where um, in Canada, radio has to play a certain amount of Canadian artists. You know, it's like uh, Canada has grants that uh, creatives can apply to and that a lot of independent artists tap into to, for, for budgets. So it's like, is, is that kind of ecosystem that's built out? That is Because if you're building something and you're the only person here, chances are, it's like, you're going you're, you're gonna to move out. Because <laughs> it's like, you're going to be one, uh, uh, want to be around other companies that, that, that can help you become even more successful. But if you become the sort of plant that says, I'm just going to, I'm willing to bet on this, and you become the sort of captain of industry that you make an other entrepreneur stay, you know what I'm saying? And, you, and you make, you're not being overly competitive, you know what I'm saying? And not letting the little guy grow, you know what I'm saying? So, so yeah, because you want them to build the company. So like going back to the, um, what I was saying about um, like United Masters and, 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 um, and Gamma and these other independent companies, I'm always asking them, how can I help? It's, by the way, it's not winner take all. I'm, 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 I feel like I'm still going to win regardless. Them lose, like the, if they lose, we lose a little bit too. You know what I'm saying? So have that mentality about building here and, and figure out who, if there are people building here, figure out how you can support them that, like right now. Great questions. You gonna do one more? Ramel, how we doing? Yeah, he had her hand up. Indy, right over here. Uh, and I'm good. Thank you so much. So this question really piggybacks off of them. Yours, it's about. Oh, I can't. 
It's sorry. It's in regards to the Philly music inf infrastructure and uh, ecosystem, particularly in regards to when you started a small successful venture. What's the best practices for expanding in terms of vetting, initiating, reaching out, um, getting buy-in for the um, vision? I say that because um, I live in LA, but I come here monthly. Um, since January, I started a. Philly youth record label, or I'm trying to, so I bring youth, I bring Philly um, artists in, into the studio for free, just to increase access to Philly artists so they can show their gift to the world because Philly artists are different, like just the way we analyze life. And so um, my question is regards to, I'm, I'm um, starting it as a nonprofit, I'm close to get, getting uh, financial sponsorship just so we get the nonprofit money coming in, like grants, but also the LA um, connections. But I'm trying to um, expand and get partnerships. Could you frame how you learned the best practices when you were expanding um, Venice? Start small. Like, I, I wouldn't say when I started Venice as much as it is, because Venice was probably different from your, 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 the experience you're doing now. Um, but my, the other two companies I built is probably way more similar. And that was literally, Adam Factory started with me by myself. And, um, and then and my assistant who was working for me for free because I couldn't really afford her. And, and, um, and then once, you know, um, Gaga started getting a little bigger, I, it was like, okay, I need somebody who can do ticketing for me because it's getting too busy, like day-to-day -day stuff. So I hi hired somebody then. And then it gets a little bigger, then I hire somebody then. So it's like, I, like I, I take it step by step. One mistake that I see that a lot of people make and that most people make is trying to do too much stuff at one time. And, and, um, and so really being able to, because execution is everything. And if you're spread out and trying to do way too many things, it's, it's, it's I'd rather have one really, really good thing than five mediocre things. And um, so, so the focus of it is important. The other piece I would say is um, on the partnerships, I always try to find out the motivation for who's on the other side of that partnership. It doesn't work the other way. It, and, and I even tell this to my team all the time internally at my company now, like you got it, like we can't, you can't go in and pitch not knowing what those other people's goals are. Like if you don't know anything about their business, their initiatives and all of those things, like you're just pushing your agenda on them. So it's like, so I try to encourage my team to, to do as much research about who we're pitching to and just get information and build our strategy around their strategy, essentially, or find somebody, find a company whose strategy aligns with our strategy. So it's like, so in that way, it's like, it makes, it, it, you're adding value from day one because you know exactly, you know, what they need. The other piece of it is I'm a, um, I'm a capitalist by heart. And so I believe, like, I don't think you, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it as a nonprofit. I just would make a, a ton of money from it and put it back in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because it, nonprofits is like you sort of live off of raising funds. And as, a, as what you're doing is super entrepreneurial. And you got to, like, to build, to build a really dope team um, everybody in my company has equity and people don't usually do that in the music industry. Everybody if, from, from my assistant to whoever, anybody that works for Venice, you actually own a piece of the company. And so, because for me to attract the best people, I got to give them skin in the game and I want them incentivized to build and equity and money is good, good incentives. Um, you as an entrepreneur should be compensated in a way that as you add value, you, you, you receive value as well. And you're able to build a team by, with those incentives as, as well. And so I just, I would, I would, I would, um, 
I would just figure out a way where it's like, there's nothing wrong for figuring out the for-profit side. And, and you, you still can tap into those same capital pools, by, by the way, because there's a lot of people who write grants for for-profit companies that are focused on, on, on youth organizations. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. One more time for Troy. Get that money. Get that <laughs> money, Troy Carter. Give it back to the kids.